you know, maybe, maybe uh, had a, a, a thought relative to the song that we just sang, you know, magnify the Lord is what the, the, the phrase was continually. One of our struggles sometimes is that we, we magnify our problems. And the more that we focus on our problems, the bigger we make our problems. But perhaps if we would magnify, like, examine and draw in closer to, to the power and the, uh, the authority that God has, that would give us a little peace. I know that I could sure practice that a little bit more at times, but just a thought. Um, listen, we are going to be talking about fruit again today. If you remember last week, we talked about fruit a little. Uh, we were working out of Jeremiah 23. Uh, being reminded there of the prophecy of the coming Messiah, that Jesus would be a, um, a part of the, the, the branch of David, a righteous branch. Um, and then as a result of that, we looked over in John chapter 15. We talked quite a bit about how he prunes us. Uh, and he prunes the branches that are uh, productive. He also prunes the branches that are unproductive. Like regardless of productivity or not, there is pruning that happens. Like that is part of it. Uh, and then we looked at what that fruit might look like. If there was good fruit, what would the good fruit be? Well, we, we certainly looked at the spiritual fruit that we find in Galatians chapter 5, and it talks about love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Did I forget one? Did anybody, did anybody miss, miss, check one I missed? Nobody's going to correct me? Patience. Patience. Oh, you're not supposed to ask for patience. Quit it. No, the, the really, really the, the truth is I did miss patience. And so all of those, though, all of those within that, uh, are things that we could use a little bit more of in our world and that we should say, Lord, help me as you uh, shape my life and as you do what you're doing in our lives, help me to reflect and become, reflect you, but become more and more fruitful for you. Well, as we begin to move further into Jeremiah, we look at chapter 24, we're going to find that God gives a vision to Jeremiah and he gives him, him an image and that image is of two different kinds of fruit. Uh, and as you look, well, they're the same fruit, but good fruit versus bad fruit, but it's a fig. Now, I don't know, are any of y'all fig people, do y'all like figs? Anybody raise your hand if you like figs or you grew up on figs? Some, ooh, not a fig person, not a fig person. Uh, now everybody's like really not sure if they want to raise their hand or not. Um, you know, you don't find generally a bunch of, like I haven't, I haven't been to the new Publix yet. You know, it's a big deal for a community like us, right? We got a new Publix up 231. Have you been there, two-story Publix? Anybody been there? Oh, a lot of people have been there. I've heard it's busy. Uh, I don't know that there's a, an eye. I mean, they got a lot of fancy stuff, right? But I don't know that they have figs, right? And if they do, let's say, let's say that they got a jelly aisle uh, and a preserves aisle. I'm not sure that's going to be the top seller. You know, I mean, I, I personally grew up in an era where um, my, a lot of my relatives, they had property. And, they, and if they had property, they had a fig tree somewhere. My granddaddy had uh, two out back. I was talking to my dad about this this week. And I said, Dad... Was that just unique to my granddaddy? Like, like he loved figs. And if I got up there at a certain time, he would have, uh, they'd have the pots out and they've got the figs that they've picked and they're getting ready to make all the preserves. And then they'd always make breakfast for us. And when they'd make the breakfast, they'd bring out the fig preserves. And I'm like, you got any Welch's grape? Uh, that, that, that's what I prefer. Just plain old Welch's grape jelly. Um, and some of you are like me. Now, I can do a Fig Newton. Fig Newtons I grew up on. Those are pretty good. But I don't think it's exactly the same thing. But as we're talking about it, here's a reality. The reality is that many of you, uh, if you've got any age to you, I'm not saying you're old if you do, if you do know people that have figs, but there's a lot more fig trees around than I think that we know. I've talked to some people even between services like, I've got a fig tree in my yard. Uh, and so uh, it once was very common, certainly was, has been common in different parts of the world. They had fig trees in Bible times in Jesus' day. Uh, but you may not know that they had fig trees all the way back at the Garden of Eden. Uh, and the way that we know that is because in, uh, early in the book of Genesis, whenever they sinned uh, and they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Lord came looking for them. They'd walk with the Lord in the cool of the day and they went out. The Lord was going to walk with them in the cool of the day. And they said, oh, we ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I realized that we are, uh, well, we're naked. Uh, and so they felt guilty about being naked or they felt whatever they felt. They realized they were naked like it was a thing. And so they remedied it. And the way that they remedied it was... Fig leaves. That's right. They took fig leaves and they sewed them together. The Bible actually tells us this is what they did. You say, well, why would they pick a fig leaf? Look at those leaves. Those are big. I mean, you need lots of coverage if you're going to do something like that. And so they, they picked the big leaves and did what they did. God didn't leave them in those for very long. Praise the Lord. Uh, he left, put them in animal skins pretty quick after that. Um, Y'all aren't laughing. This is supposed to be funny. 
So in case you wondered, before there was uh, Under Armour or Fruit of the Loom, uh, there was fig leaves. Uh, so now you know a little bit of history. But look, they're, they're in the Bible. Figs have been used a number of times as images. And here, God's going to use them. Now, I want to just tell you, it, one of the things that you're going to find here is this picture of the good figs that are very, very good. And like there's, very, there's no middle ground. And bad figs that are unedible. They're just bad. It's not like, well, it's okay. No, it's good, very, very good and bad. And as we look at those, what you're literally going to find, and I'm just kind of telling you on the, up, the, the, the beginning part of where we're headed, which is that God is going to do what he said he was going to do, which is always what he does. And as a result, we're going to be reminded that when he disciplines us, that is part of discipling. Part of becoming more like Christ is to be disciplined by a loving Heavenly Father. We should lean into that and not run from it. Because when you run from it, there are often consequences that come from avoiding that pain, avoiding that difficulty. And so um, to illustrate that, we're going to literally, we're going to look at Jeremiah 24. And so I want you to turn there with me as we look at Jeremiah 24. Um, I want you to follow along with me as I read. Here's what it says. It says, after Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken into exile from Jerusalem, Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim. Some of you are like, okay, this is my first time in church in a while, and I'm like already lost. You just mentioned a whole bunch of stuff out of history. We've been walking through the book of Jeremiah, and within the book of Jeremiah, there's a lot of history. Uh, literally, there's a very firm date to when what's being described happens, uh, which is kind of a cool thing for you, all of you history nerds and science buffs and archaeology people. Like, that amount of information between Nebuchadnezzar being the king of Babylon and, Jer and uh, the exile of Je 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 I'm stutter stuttering now. Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. That tells us, those that study that tells us a lot. Real place, real time. But when this happened, it says, together with the officials of Judah, the craftsmen, the metal workers, and, uh, and had brought them to Babylon, the Lord showed me this vision. So at that time, at the time that's described here, this is the vision that God gave him. Behold, two baskets of figs placed before the temple of the Lord. One basket had very good figs. The first ripe, that like first ripe figs, which would be the, 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 the first and the best. But the other basket had very bad figs, so bad that they could not be eaten. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? It's like a teachable moment. God's going to show him. It's all right, Jeremiah, tell me what you see. He says, figs, the good figs, very good. And the bad figs, very bad. So bad that they cannot be eaten. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs. So I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. Now I want to pause here for a second. I want you to see what's happening. God is literally, as he explains this story, is starting out by telling us, that those that are the exiles are the ones that are the good figs. He is blessing those that he is sending out of the land that he prepared for them. And in our own minds, I think that, that, that it's a struggle sometimes because like, if God gave them this land, why on earth would they ever leave it? There's a time, and this is a, a disciplining time. They've not done what they, said they, they were said they were supposed to do, what he told them to do. And there's a group that's going to stay, and there's a group that, that's leaving as he had encouraged. And the ones that are fighting against what God had told them to do, they're going to be the ones that stay. The point is that there's a, there is a time that God can tell you that it's time to move. And when he tells you it's time to move, at that point, it's not the time to stay. Not if you want his blessing. Now, what am I saying here? I could be saying a whole lot of things, right? But in your life, you're going to go through different phases of life. And when you get through those different places, I got to be careful because I'm going to, before, if I'm not careful, I won't even finish the, reading the text. Um, what you have going on, if we look in our lives, is that, and this is literally part of it, when God's trying to tell you something, when he's trying to move you, when he's trying to cause you to make an adjustment that would cause you to grow. I mean, have you ever noticed that we get to a certain level of pruning or growth or training and we we're, we're content with where we are this is this is this is this happens naturally in our lives and it's only uh through those that in this case it, it, it it's the lord but it could be a father it could be um a coach it could be a boss it could be a teacher 
in your life. It could be a friend that, that comes along and is, is an encouragement to you, that, that, that challenges you, that causes you, uh, seeks to help you make progress. But if we never get challenged, we don't get better. Think about it. Like in our world, what happens whenever you don't continue to make progress forward? You don't continue to grow. Well, in the, in the, in the, the, the athletic world, the muscles, not lethargy. What do they call it when the, when the muscle atrophy? Thank you. I didn't use this illustration in the first one. Just trying to go off the cuff. That didn't work so good. <laughs> atrophy, right? The muscles shrink up. They die. Is that good or bad? Well, nobody wants atrophy. If you get that, you can't even do what you used to be able to do. And so what you know is that you've got to continue to excel and continue to, to shape and sharpen and get better, or you won't even be able to do the things that you've been able to do before. In life, here's what we've got to hear. Partly, we've got to be able to hear that... I'm going to take my finger off that just for a second. Verse 5 is where I'm at, and I'm going to, I'm going to step... Well, I've got to remember that. Verse 5, okay? Daphne, verse 5. Um, so, here's, so here's the deal. Whenever we're dealing with, like, I'm dealing with my, my lovelies, my church family, right? Uh, you guys are walking through different phases of life. Literally, we have people, um, and we're not going to point you out and say which category you're in, but you're, you're at the, the most mature phase of life and longest in tooth. Uh, and, and, and we have some that are elementary students and below, okay? And so in those phases, like, the reality is that there's a growth process, and, and there's, there's, it's tough because there's so much going on in the world. It would be really nice, like I think it would be nice, I think most of you would agree it would be nice, if things were relatively simple. And in some ways they are simple, but in some ways they're just not. Like, you know, we talked a little bit about people being, like, they're both the blessing and the struggle, right? Uh, like, they're the purpose, but they're also the problem. Uh, and, and that's true, like, in marriage, that's true. Uh, I waited for the service without Christy in it to say that, but, but like, I'm the problem, right? Like, like we, we, we're the solution and we're the problem. And so as we, as we look at our world, the same is true um, in just about every aspect of our world. Now, when we're, we're walking through life, we, 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 we start off as children, we have to go through some phases. I'm just going to tell you out loud, kindergarten was my favorite grade ever. I mean, Bernice Max Spadden was the greatest kindergarten teacher, I think, that anybody could ever have. She was mine, and I had no better... I mean, if you're in school and you're past kindergarten, I am so sorry. You probably have had the best year you're ever going to have, uh, which is not a great thing to say, all right? But back then, we got... I mean, we didn't have to learn a whole lot back then, I don't think. I mean, now they learn all... They're probably doing algebra, but back then, it was like, um, you know, naps and, and, uh, and cookies. I mean, it was pretty, pretty cool. But you know, they've made me learn some stuff along the way. They, 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 they forced some hard things out of me. I had some hard teachers along the way. Um, some of you have been some of them, and I'm sharper for that. But you don't know what you put me through. Uh, there's supposed to be a joke there. But, but, but the fact is that parents are the same way. You go through hard times, and you get to a place like, look, I've learned enough. I don't want to learn anymore. Well, guess what? That's not the way the world works. And, and all along the way, you're getting older. Like as, as it starts out, now you're, you're, you're maturing and in middle school, they get taller. I mean, and they mature and then there's a lot more growth that goes on, but also mentally and emotionally growth has to continue to occur. And then somewhere along the way, relationships happen and it happens at different times for everybody. But the fact of the matter is that there is a difficulty level that happens whenever you, when you graduate and you have your own set of bills to pay. Oh my, it's different, isn't it? Like I remember, I remember gentlemen, anybody remember, uh, getting, getting married and, and, and your dad looking at you different than he's ever looked at you before. Like, I mean, you, you've, you've, you've got, you, you know, I got dad's blessing and I, and I got Christie's daddy's blessing and we made a home and we got married, but it was different after that. Like I'm, uh, we're our own family. We're like, yeah, I'm my own man. Well, yeah, I'm my own man. Oh no, Lord help me. I'm my own man. Like, what does this mean? And so what is that? What it means is you got to keep growing. Because now the responsibility levels increase. It's not like I'm just sitting here saying, Lord, I'm just going to grow today to be a little bit, or, and then say, okay, well, I've grown enough. I know everything that I need to know. It just keeps getting tougher. Now, in the world that you live in, you add to that. You add to that, the, not, not just the age deal, but the fact of the matter is that every step of the way that we grow, we encounter things. We, and I'm just being real and honest with you guys. We encounter things like depression, and we encounter things like uh, deployment. 
In this world, some, there's some of y'all that can, can understand that term deployment because you, you, you've been through them and they come at times that you didn't expect and sometimes not at times that you, uh, sometimes you did expect it, but you didn't expect the place or to be like it was. You deal with divorce that you didn't expect. Like, does anybody ever expect one of those? Or you deal with, with death. Uh, and, 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 and the reality of the matter is when somebody around us that we expected to be there is not there, it changes things. Are we talking real now? And so because this is true, I hate to say it, these are pruning moments. These are growing spaces. And they're often not spaces that we get to choose to grow in. But we do get to choose. You've heard, you've heard it, it's very common to hear this concept that we, we don't choose our circumstances so often, but we do get to choose how we respond to what happens to us, right? Well, we often don't get to choose the way in which God determines he's going to discipline us, disciple us, to help us to grow we do get to choose our response to him. And literally what you're, as I finish up reading this text, what you're going to see him say is that you should lean in when he lovingly is willing to discipline you. Don't run from what he is putting in your pathway to strengthen you. Now, as we, let, let me finish the text so that, that, you, that you can see the picture um, hopefully color in a little bit better. He goes on it. After saying there's going to be these, these different kinds of figs, he says, uh, I'm going to regard as good figs. So he's given us the picture of who are the very good figs. They're the people that, um, that actually were obedient. So that's the key word for today is obedience. Like they, it didn't make a lot of sense, but they did. Like if we're God's people, why would you make us leave this land that you gave us? He said, time's up, guys. It's time for you to actually make this move. And so um, he says, I'm going to regard as good the ones that are the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear it down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return to me with their whole heart. I, I want to be that. I want to be that group, don't you? Like, like, Lord, let me be. If even if I don't get it first right, and and you have to discipline me, and cause me to to go through a hard time to be uh, to 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 be shaped and to be strengthened and to be disciplined and discipled, Lord, I want to be one that, that that gathers. Like, I want to hear your heart. I want to grab a hold of your heart, and I want you to be my God, and I want to be your people. So then he said he's going to describe the bad figs, but thus says the Lord in verse eight. Like the bad figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten, so will I treat Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his officials, the remnant of Jerusalem who remain in this land, and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. I will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth to be a reproach, a byword, a taunt, and a curse in all the places where I shall drive them. And I will send sword, famine, and pestilence upon them until they shall be utterly destroyed from the land that I gave to them and their fathers. Now that's heavy. But you want, as, as you listen to the words that he has said, he is actually, this is not just in one moment, in, I mean it is one moment in time, but it doesn't happen uh, in a vacuum. He's already told them what he's going to do. He already told them what the outcome was going to be. If, you back, if we backtrack just a couple of chapters to chapter 21, he warned them in advance. And he says in chapter 21, verse 8, he says, And to this people you shall say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. So he's giving them a choice. So you back it up. He's like, all right, y'all had a choice. The way of life and the way of death. He who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out and surrenders to the Chaldeans who are besieging you shall live and shall have his life as a prize of war. I've set my face against this city for harm and not for good, declares the Lord. Now, he did that because of how unfaithful they had been in their actions. Um, you may ask the question, well, 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 why would he do that? Well, one of the reasons is found in chapter 22, verse 8, where he says, Many nations will pass by this city, and every man will say to his neighbor, Why has the Lord dealt thus with this great city? And they will answer, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshiped other gods and served them. In other words, what God has said here is telling them in advance, you guys, not y'all, but, but to this group of people, you need to repent. 
um, of your ways, but the consequences are coming regardless. We've gone past the potential of you staying where you're at, and you're going to have to be removed and sent away for a while before I bring you back. Now, if we're looking, a lot of us love chapter 29. I don't know about y'all, but I'm thankful that the Lord has not planned uh, calamity for me, but goodness, right? Um, and and when, we, when we look at, at, at chapter 29, we're, it, we love that, to look at that verse as people that want to believe that God's got a better thing coming, that he'll restore the fortune, that he will bring back the days that he has planned in advance. Well, the fact of the matter is, to get to that place, there has to be a, a going away before there can be a coming back. This is the earlier part of that story. It's a painful part of that story. All of us, I think, would choose a story without pain, wouldn't we? I mean, it, that would be just that would be wonderful. I mean, uh, but but the story is not is not what it is without the pain. That's what generates the growth. That's what creates uh, the tender heart. That's what causes us to be shaped in a way that we look to Him and we trust Him, and we can seek to honor Him. As you look at this, though, I think there's a there's still a tendency as we look at our own lives to, to be our own narrator, right? I mean, we, we tend to look at our lives and we, we feel justified in so much of what really all of us do and in, in the things that we say and the things that we do. And I think sometimes we fail to see the role that God plays um, as one who is overall. One of the very, I think, I think, key ideas that's found in this text is that we have to be afraid of God himself. We don't have to fear any man, but we should be afraid of dishonoring God. We should be afraid of not being obedient to God and what that looks like. Like we should believe that the consequences for disobeying him are not going to be good. We have to believe and should believe that he is going to rectify all wrongs, which means if you and I are the ones that commit the wrong, that he's He's going he's gonna to bring, uh, bring justice about in the same way. It does not work for us to say that God is a God of grace and mercy in this whole list of, of very gentle and tender things without also saying that God is a God of wrath and he's a God of justice and he's a God of righteousness and he's a God that when he says something, he does what he says. Aren't y'all glad God's dependable? Like, I'm glad that he's dependable. I'm glad he's ever faithful. But I'm glad he loves me even when I don't know. Like, he would have, I would have probably harmed myself. And God sometimes steps in and disciplines me and keeps me from harming myself. Like, does this make sense? Like, I don't, I'm not physically ever going to harm myself. I don't mean it like that. Uh, but, but sometimes decisions that we make. I mean, you've got children that would make decisions like that, right? I mean, you just let them loose. I, I, I don't even know who all of them in the room are, but, but you, you, some of y'all have that kid. I'm not going to make you raise your hand like I did with the figs. But some of y'all said, hey, how many of you got kids that aren't scared of anything? Like, they don't know fear. And you can say, oh, it's that one. Well, that's the one. You've got you to keep a bridle on that one because if you don't, they're going to hurt themselves. Well, that's the role. In large part, that's the role of the father. And sometimes... Like, I've actually witnessed a child that tried to run into the street and got a, a really stern, not talking to, uh, they, 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 they got a memorable moment on the backside because if they don't learn to be scared of cars, because if they're not scared of the car, be scared of the consequences of mom and dad. If they don't, like, the, the pain has to be given as a consequence or they'll never learn it. Am I making sense? I'm kind of preaching to the choir probably. So... If we want to look and say, well, where else, is, this, is this principle found elsewhere in Scripture? Well, the answer is yes. Solomon wrote a lot. And he wrote in a, in, a, in a desire to share the wisdom God had given to him with future generations. And we have that. And in the beginning of that book, he says, the fear of the Lord, chapter, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. So you want to start out smart and strong and wise? Believe that God is the, and knowledge of him is where, where true knowledge comes from. But you want to be a fool, then you deny all of that, right? Because fools despise wisdom and instruction. In chapter 3, and this is going to sound really New Testament when I say this, okay? In chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, it says this, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. 
The reason that sounds so New Testament to you is because that is found in the book of Hebrews. It's a quotation that the writer of Hebrews uses to remind those that were being chastened, those that were they're tired, those that felt like they'd been through the ringer and back. Some of you are some of them. Like, like literally, I think some of you are going through, through, through a lot. And, and as you're walking through the things that you're walking through, be reminded that this is the way that God strengthens us. You're like, well, I don't know how much I can take. Have you ever had a coach that ran you till you couldn't run anymore and ran you some more? I mean, they, they, they put you through the ringer in order to make you stronger. And yet you willingly or your parents willingly allow you to be subjected to that kind of coaching so that you can get better, so that you can get stronger. Like we know that this is like the reality of how strength is built and how um, tenacity and, and the ability to continue and persevere through hard things, right? And yet so often we run from that. I don't know that it's fair for me to stand up here and say, look, you should ask the Lord to put you through pain on the regular. Like, I don't know that that, I mean, there's something that just seems not right about wanting to be disciplined, but but if we want to grow, then we're going to have to experience the things that have to happen for growth to occur because there's not really a shortcut, if you will. I mean, you can learn from the scars of others and you can learn from some of your own, but you're going to walk through some difficult places and God is going to grow you through those things. Anybody can relate to anything I'm saying? I think you can. And the truth is that some of you are much stronger than you were, but here's the crazy part. Once you make, once you have, I mean, you met some of you like, Oh, I made it through high school. That's great. And then college hits. But listen, as you're, as you're an adult and a parent, you think it'd get easier. I talked to some, some that uh, are on the grandparent side of things after the first service and they're like, Hey, you talked a lot about the young ones. You know, you know that it doesn't get easy. There's still stuff I'm dealing with that I had never faced before, right? Like, the, like it's almost like I'm not a big video game person, okay? Like way back in the day, I, I enjoyed the big the box arcade games, you know? I'm not real great at them but because I, I didn't put a bunch of quarters in them. If the sun was out, I was out fishing. But in some ways, life is like a video game because each level gets harder, And you get to the place that you can handle some of that lesser stuff a lot simpler. But guess what? You got new enemies. You you, you got a next level. You got more of them. It's does this just make sense? Parents, you know. I mean, you you, you get it. You you thought having the little I mean, I I hate to like bring a reality check to those of you that uh, you know, you're not sleeping at night because the kids uh, schedules out of whack. There's worse things coming. I mean, there, there's, there, there's, there's nice that your kids keep you up, but they ain't even at the house. You know what I mean? Uh, y'all aren't laughing. <laughs> this is real. And here's the truth of it. God loves us through all of it. And he's got a plan. And our obedience through that plan, that is the, that's the picture of God strengthening us and helping us become who we're supposed to be. But if we want to become that person with a tender heart, that hears the voice of God and is close to him, almost invariably we're going to have to experience some pain. It's almost true without exception that there are going to be times that you go through phases where the people around you don't get it. I mean, can, can we be real? The Bible's replete with that. Like, there's lots of that in the Bible. It also doesn't mean that just because you're the only one that thinks it means you're right. That's not true either. But part of what it means to walk by faith is to do what you believe that God has led you to do. And when that gets tested, well, that's when you're going to grow. But let me make this tough. I mean, I'm not trying to make it tough. But we want to talk about rubber meeting the road. For the kiddos, it means you've got to, you've got to, maybe put up's not the right word. You've got to embrace the struggle in the classroom of learning that math that you don't think you're ever going to use because you're going to be stronger for having learned it. And you're going to need it for some other stuff and you don't know yet. And that one teacher or that one coach that is just, I mean, pounding you, maybe this is God's instrument to make you stronger maybe i mean 
Woe is us. Woe is me. If we say, uh-uh, I'm not going through that, whatever the, like, I don't, I don't want what he wants for me, so I'm going to take, avoid, I'm going to reject this, and I'm going to choose not to be obedient to him. It, it may mean something about where you work. Like, I'm being real. I'm not saying people don't have reason to be offended, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of people who just, they don't want, our world doesn't want any pain anytime. I mean, I had a lot of friends, if, 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 when we had to spend the night parties, that meant you spent the night, you had the good time, you got up the next day, and you either did the chores with them or you left because they were doing chores on Saturday morning. I don't think that happens a whole lot anymore. Anybody else grow up pulling weeds? I mean, my dad didn't make the neighborhood kids do the chores, but I'm just telling you, we, we're almost like, well, that'd be abuse. I, you don't have a clue what it, what, what it used to be. And, and that's part of why we're not as strong as we've been in some ways. Are you listening to me? I'm telling you to, to lean in, not lean into weed pulling, but lean into the pruning. Lean in to God's mechanisms to grow us. In the lean times, become more like more likely to be obedient and listen a little closer and be a little bit more still and less likely to run and less likely to push back. Are you, are you, you hearing what I'm saying? Because if God is trying to say things to you that he's said throughout history, you don't want to be the one to say, all the voices, all the prophets have said, hey, we're going to be fine. We've got to stay put. And yet there was Jeremiah, that one guy saying, uh, guys, that's not what God said. Because everybody got the penalty, like everybody got the penalty from it. And so let's be that group of people that says, we fear God. And we know that every man is fallible. And so we go to his, his word as truth, but then when it comes to, to our looking at, at home and looking at family and looking at work and looking at community and like looking at, at the world that we live in, we say, Lord, grow us, help us to, to be who we're supposed to be. Help us to not take the shortcuts, but become the person you've called us to be. And look, I'm all about processes and those kind of things. Like, I think those are good things and the consistency matters. But you know what's crazy? Sometimes we just have to act in obedience to do the thing that he told us to do when we don't get it or understand it. I mean, that was a Job move right there. Job stayed put, right? But there wasn't a person in his life. His best friends ridiculed him. And, and, the, and doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we got to all make sure that we're on the right side of that. But rather than to run from it, he could have turned and said, God, I give up. I don't trust you anymore. If this is how it goes, I'm out. My fake's gone. I, I've had plenty. That's not what he did. He took it and he continued to grow. And you find this with the different disciples. Listen, guys, gals, we, we, if we're going to be who he's called us to be, then that means we need to be able to listen to the voice of, of God as he is putting circumstances into our life and allowing us to endure hard things, whatever that phase is. And if it's your kids that are, that, that are, that are giving you a touch, just keep trusting him. Keep trusting him with your kids. Keep praying to him and putting their names before him. If it's about having gifts, keep putting that heart's wish before God and let God resolve that because there are things that are above our pay grade that we don't get the prerogative to fix. They're like literally outside of our control. I think if I was trying to say it in a way that I think Jesus would, there are some things that only faith can fix. Like, like our trusting God to do what only God can do. What is it up to us to do? It's, to, it's up to us to be obedient. It's up to us to be obedient. And I, you know, I've thought about this, and I, there are times that I could, like I could go back and, and, and point to you times in days past when, when I did things that I didn't know why I was doing them, but I was just supposed to do them, and so I did it. And I thought, but, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to rehearse. I, I may one day, I will. I know I'll tell some stories from days gone by. But I'm going to rehearse another one for you that's fairly recent. Like this past week, Bill, you were supposed to speak. You were going to get to speak again. Don't worry. It's going to happen. But, but you couldn't. So physically you weren't able. So Cody stepped in last minute. Um, and was trying to get prepared. We knew he found out about 3.30 in the afternoon last Sunday night. We had our men's dinner. Um, Cody calls me. Uh, we were all communicating, me and Alex, and just all of us trying to figure out that make sure that everything was ready. Um, and, and Cody says, look, I, don't, I feel weird asking this, but can you have the baptistry filled up? I mean, it's just right out there. It's, a, it's empty. It's a piece of furniture until we bring it in here and fill it with 100 gallons of water, and then it's not. 
Um, and so we brought it in here and we did it. And, and I said, that's fine, Cody. Like, I, if you think God said that's what you're supposed to do and you feel led that way, then let's, let's not be wrong. And so we did it. And I mean, we're just being real. Like, I didn't think anything was going to happen. I mean, I, I didn't know anything wouldn't happen, but I just thought I was trying to do what that we're going to ask Cody to speak. And he feels led that that's how God leads. That, that's fine. And Alex was along the way. So we get to the end of it. And Cody, Cody's a pretty confident guy. And he told, a, hey man, he told a great story about how God's changed. I mean, God's been working in his life even in recent months. I mean, it, it, he just has. And so that part was really neat. But then he says, uh, he apologized like 10 times for the baptistry at the front and not knowing why it was there. And you could tell he wasn't sure what to do with it. And he didn't want it to be awkward at the end. I said, look, just turn it over to me. I'll figure out what to do. And so he got done and he just went, he just knelt right there and prayed right those, by those steps. And I said, guys, listen, I don't know what's supposed to happen right here. I know I'm supposed to pray. And I know that, that, um, like, I know that God wants to work in all of our lives individually. So I'm going to pray over the group. And if there's any of you, I said, Alex, I said, Alex, you be over there. And I, said, and I said, if there's any of you that feel like you're why the tank's full, then I want you to come down here and talk to Alex while I'm praying. And then whenever we get done praying, we'll baptize you. And so sure enough, I, we bowed our heads and I prayed. I, I thought it was a good prayer, but anyway, um, I don't know. I did my best to just echo that we would be obedient. That was the key words, obedient. And when, when, I, when I lifted my head up, sure enough, Zach was right over there. Not, and, and by the way, when we say Zach got bad, it wasn't Cody's partner, Zach, just FYI. I think we ought to clarify that. I was going to ask Zach how many times this week he got asked if, he, if Cody baptized him. It's not that Zach, all right? But there was a gentleman named Zach that's been attending the church but just has not been baptized. And it was, he, he just on the spot, we baptized him. It was an incredible moment. And I was just going to do it, right? And the guys were like, can we come down there? And I'm like, it's like a bunch of like teenage guys. I'm like, yeah, come on down here. And so we did it. It was a beautiful moment, but only because we were obedient. And I would tell you that that's not the norm, except just a couple of months ago, we had another fellow who's in hospice care and we got a phone call and they said, would you fill the baptistry? Like, like, could we baptize this fellow that you don't know that's accepted Christ who's at the end of his life? And I was like, yeah. We'll fill the tank. And then I thought he wasn't coming, but he did come. And it was a beautiful moment because we were obedient. Listen, I can't tell you what God does. I mean, I can't tell you. It's amazing what he does when we're obedient. And it's even when, it, it, often especially when we don't think it's going to happen. Like, are you hearing what I'm saying? Cody didn't think anybody was going to get baptized. He knew in his gut he was supposed to ask for the baptistry to be filled. But he didn't really think it was going to work. That's why I was over here bawling when if somebody actually came forward. Like, it's a good thing whenever God actually shows up. And I'm just going to, listen, I, and we, we got five minutes and we got to get out of here. I want you to experience what it looks like to be obedient to God. But if you do the next thing that you feel like doing, because it seems simple or because it's comfortable or it doesn't take you out of your comfort zone, Number one, you're not going to grow. But number two, you may not get to experience faith being grown and being built into the person that God wants you to be because you didn't trust him. You didn't trust him when you couldn't see the way. You couldn't, didn't trust him when you didn't know how it was going to happen. You just knew that God wanted it to happen. Because the way of faith is not the way that everybody pressures or says you should be about. The way of faith is trusting God and taking him at his word. And what Jeremiah had done... And a small group of people, a remnant had done, is they had been willing to take, even after having been collectively unfaithful and then being exiled, they took God at his word. Number one, that he was sending them away, but there would be a hope in the days ahead. But number two, that he would somehow figure out how to bring them back to that place. What does that mean for you? If you're going to grow in your faith, you're going to be pruned. And everything's going to get pruned, right? The bad branches and the good branches. Like, but I didn't do anything wrong. Do you know sometimes you get sent away even when you did it right? The answer of staying still is not always the right answer even if you did everything the way you were supposed to. Abraham was a man that was following God and God said, I want you to leave the place you've been your whole life and go to a place that I will show you which would make all of us want to say, uh, Lord, can I have a few more details? What is the housing arrangement going to be like? 
Because my wife has a list, it's a place, a list of things that, and, and maybe you do, you know, how close is that going to be to the finest fisheries? You know, no, 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 Lord, I just want to be where you are. That's the kind of faith that we ought to have is Lord, I just want what you want. So we live in 2024 in a place that God has created you and he's put you and it's not an accident. And you're like, man, it may not be accidental, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dog fight some days, but he's in charge and we walk forward Makings, my friends, the Makings, we walk forward one day at a time, don't we? You can't hold on to yesterday. You didn't ask for where you're at, but you trust God that he's got, he's got your tomorrow. And when you have to do the hard things with your kids, you're trusting him that he's got your kids. And whenever you have to make the hard decisions in life and things that are excruciating, you still have to say, Lord, I trust you, even though I don't know how this is going to go down. And when you think you got it figured out, stand by. Because the board's going to change. The faces around you are going to change. The obstacles are going to be different. There's going to be more of them. They'll be bigger. They'll have bigger bullets. I don't know. That's how it always seemed. They had more powerful stuff in the video games. But doesn't it seem harder? But is God still God? God's still God. So here's, here's the bottom line. And we're going to pray and go. The bottom line is that when God has got you in a pruning season, don't run. Lean in. Lean in and trust him. Lean in and trust him. That's harder to do than it is for me to say. And my sympathy and empathy both. There's things you're experiencing I've never experienced. There's things that some of you are walking through that I have walked through. It's hard. And I got no doubt I'm headed to some days in the days ahead that are going to be hard if the Lord lets us, lets us live a few more days. Why? Because that's the promise. And then one day he's going to take us home to be with him. But between now and then, I look forward to loving you and living alongside you and doing life by faith. But let's trust him. Let's be obedient. Let's be obedient and let's lean in when he wants to go to pruning. Why? Because we want to be the good figs. Very good. Not the bad or the rotten. Stand together with me and let's, let us pray. Y'all are standing here looking at me. I'm going to give you one verse. Can I do that? A lot of times I'll finish a message and they're like, hey, what verse was that? The whole point that I gave you is Proverbs 123. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you and I will make my words known to you. In other words, when God seeks to correct, lean in. Don't turn away. Proverbs 123. Lord, we are grateful, these are your people, to gather together, to sing your praise, to recognize that you are in charge. And Lord, it is our desire collectively to be obedient to you. We want to be faithful to you. And Lord, there is a micro level that that happens on, like inwardly and individually. We have to make a decision that we trust you more than anyone else, that we trust your word and we want what you want. And Lord, I pray that you would help that to be like on our lips this week. Lord, we want your plan. In the hard days, we want you pruning us as needed to become who you've called us to be. Because we want to serve you. Lord, I also pray that we would collectively on a more macro level, that we would express um, in how we do life. Just our desire to be salt and light, to be an encouragement to others, to be that coach, to be that employer, to be that teacher that is lovingly and for all the right reasons, the ones that encourage growth. We need people that make us better and that are tough at times with love and with mercy, but tough in order to help us to be, to be all that we can be. Father, we trust you. We're grateful. If there's any in here who have never trusted Christ, we know that you alone are the place that we can find peace, and you alone are the place that we have comfort for life in eternity and peace in the here and now. But Father, if we've chosen you in previous days as Savior, I pray that you would help us to continually put our heart, like hold loosely to the things of this world, and to keep our heart uh, before you, and dedicated to you in all things. We love you, Father. We're grateful. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said? Amen. All right.